Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land to talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we are on the ninth commandment in our series on the Ten Commandments. Almost to the end, what are we going to do next? I think we're going to talk some we're more about We're going to go through it again, just like the Bible does. <laughs> <laughs> Here's our review That's of Deuteronomy. Right. Yeah, well, you do get to Deuteronomy eventually. Yeah. Sure. yeah, you're not really joking, um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll save that for later. Good things are coming. Um, but today, the ninth commandment, um, that is, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Uh, so we are talking about the nature of truth and the faithful witness. In contrast to actual truth in recent decades, we've seen the rise of postmodernism, uh, especially this um, denial of absolute truth. Do you want to tell us a little bit, Greg, about where postmodernism came from, what it's a response to? How old is it really? Because I kind <laughs> of don't believe that it's actually new to the 20th century. <laughs> well, as I understand postmodernism, it is relatively new under that name and within those parameters. But we can go back to ancient Greece. We can look, particularly uh, in, in the light of the New Testament, we can look at the Hellenistic age that followed uh, the classical period, the golden age of Greece, where we have Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. And they're all so certain. Well, Socrates says he's not certain about anything, except that truth is out there. And you can find it if you ask enough questions. Plato has some wonderful, great ideas and disdains anybody who questions him, except Aristotle who comes along and questions him to pieces and has a better idea still. And everything's great. Then Alexander goes out and conquers the world. And all of this, Athens is the center of the universe and explains everything, kind of falls apart. And we move from the polis-centered philosophies of uh, Plato and Aristotle to a cosmopolitan series of philosophies that include, and I'll probably miss them since I don't have my notes in front of me, skepticism that asks whether we can know anything at all, cynicism, which says, now we really can, and let's just live like dogs in the meantime, we'll look like the animals we are, stoicism, which says the universe is God and God's the universe, and it's kind of, there's a rational fire unfolding itself, the force is with us. Um, there are the Epicureans <laughs> who say everything's materialistic. Uh, there may be gods, but if they, if they exist, they're way out there, really don't have anything to do with us. On top of that, it was an age uh, that, that people who didn't follow the formal philosophies dabbled in magic, in astrology. They pursued escapist fantasy. They, um, and then there were the ever popular mystery cults, the dying and rising God who gave some kind of, it was an age of despair, an age of imagination, an age, one writer says in an age of contradictions, uh, one of the greatest was that this, this age that emphasized so much man's reason veered right off into irrationality. I believe that was Michael Grant, who's the authority these days on that period. This is the age in which Pontius Pilate lived, and we all know the story. Christ is brought before him. He looks him in the eye, looks him up and down, thinks, what is this anyway? Oh, it's political games. It's the Jews again. I know about this. Look, all he has got to say is I'm a king, and I can wipe this off the board and go on with life. So you're a king, are you? You're asking for yourself, or are you asking because someone told you? I'm not a Jew. What's Your own chief priest said, what have you, what have you done? Say you're a king and we're done. My kingdom's not of this world. But wait, <laughs> king, king. So you are a king. Just say yes and we're done. Thou sayest that I am a king. You said it. Your words, not mine, correct, but not <laughs> probably don't mean what you think they mean. And I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone says of the truth. Her, hers, here's my voice. We're talking politics and you're talking philosophy. What is truth? And he storms out and says, this, no, whatever you guys are trying to sell me, this guy ain't it. I don't know what he is, but he's not that. And of course, eventually they say, well, he claimed to be the son of God. And Pilate turns around and goes back and where do you come from? <laughs> because in his universe, that was not an impossibility that heaven should step into the, the divine, should step into the temporal. Hey, there was a guy in the throne who claimed to be the son of God, you know. So it was that kind of age where all kinds of things were possible. Nobody had a set truth. The only set truth was Caesar is Lord. And as long as you caved into that one, put the incense on the altar, you can believe anything you want. Rome was a construct held together by military force 
of dozens of different worldviews, many of them competing, many of them at odds, many of them off in a corner, and nobody cornered the market. You know, and then came Christianity. Uh, and the postmodern worldview that Pilate held to crumbled in the face of the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we, this idea that there are no absolutes, that the truth is up for grabs, that truth is a word, is nothing new. Now, you both may know more about the recent historical origins of postmodernism than I do, and you're, I invite you freely to share. Uh, but of course, the, the more recent, uh, recent being the previous century roots are in Hegel, in his idea of synthesis and the other philosophers who followed quickly in his wake. Relativism is nothing new. There are, this, this, is a, this is a generation that has faithfully embraced. There are no absolutes. There is no truth. Reality isn't real. And uh, if, you, if you think that you have some kind of real stuff and you're trying to sell it to us, obviously this is a power play. You're out to enforce your power on us, your position on us. And um, we're not buying. We're not buying anybody's. Everybody has their story. Everybody has their construct. Um, yours is no better than anybody else's because none of them is real. And if we can all be happy with that, Let's just love one another and have a good time and sing Kumbaya. Or some equivalent within your particular storyline. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are your own experiences with, with postmodernism or deconstruction or uh, relativism? What comes to mind for you? College campus. <laughs> Do you have specifics that, you, that come to mind, Brad? Uh, not really any specific instances, just the general atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Emily, how about you? Um, I'm thinking of the narrative that is predominant in, again, college campuses today and through the media, where the guiding organizing principle with which we look back on history is that of power and power disparity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not quite postmodernism proper, but sort of fallout from postmodernism, where we've tried to reject all the meta narratives. We've tried to reject any guiding principle, but we as humans can't live like that. We can't look back at history without finding something or imposing something on it. Um, and that's that's what we have right now in the media. We necessarily need a grid of interpretation. And, and if we simply acknowledge that, that would be one thing, and then we could just fight over whose grid we're going to use. But I think what we're seeing is the denial that grids, the, 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 the rejection of the idea that one grid is superior to any others. And then once we've put down everybody else, we take ours, or the popular mm -hmm. one, or the one that all of our friends cling to, or the one that will get us invited to all the right cocktail parties, and we surreptitiously insert that and say, yeah, we're beyond all of that. Mm -hmm. This is just facts. This isn't yeah. interpretation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interpretation would be, it's, you know, groundless. It's <laughs> ironically having declared that there is no objective truth to then claim what I'm telling you is objectively true. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's no spin at all on it. <laughs> yeah. There, there was a time when you could go to, you could sit in a college classroom and the professor would say, you know, there's no absolute truth. And you could raise your hand and say, Professor, I have one question. Yes, student. Are you absolutely sure about that? Yes. Yeah, so there is one absolute truth that there's no absolute truth. I, uh, <laughs> Nowadays, you know, someone would, would respond, no, I'm not sure. But that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, because we, there's this self-consciousness now that like, oh, I guess I can't be sure, but I'm... I'm going to pretend I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, pretend I'm okay with that. That's a lot of it. I remember when I was in, in college, that one, one of the cards you could always play to snap people out of their relatives, their moral relativism, was, so was it all right, was it morally acceptable for Hitler to murder, murder six million Jews? And that was always the one that stopped people dead in their tracks. Because there was no, back when 1970s, early 80s, 
there was no way you could say, yeah, that was okay, or well, their culture tolerated, or their call it, their culture embraced it. Who am I to quit? You could not do that. That was the one place where you absolutely had to say, yes, that was evil, even though it undercut everything else you're saying. That's no longer true. Well, first of all, people say, who's Hitler? And what did he have to do with and Jews? And six million is kind of a high estimate, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> That's what people say. Yeah. Well, I, I grew up hearing that because I grew up in a, a household that was tainted by, I don't like the word, but I'll call it what is usually called anti-Semitism. Because technically, Semitic would include the Arabs. So, you know, right. <laughs> it's a problem with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Anti-Zionist at the very least. Uh, so I, I, I heard those things, and, but at least at that point, they were facts that could be debated. They may be, they may be lies, but you could debate it with facts, and people were still arguing facts back and forth. Something that comes to mind within just the last few years. I can remember not very long ago when the issue of global cooling, which became global warming, which became climate change, was still something that we argued about with scientific facts. And it was just a question of whose facts you were listening to, whether or not you trusted sources and such. Somewhere within the last couple of years, that all went away. Mm -hmm. It is now a fact. It just, the, the, the people who are arguing that, that it's a thing simply decided we're, we're done arguing. We are simply going to begin assuming it is a fact. And people who don't agree are enemies of the environment, enemies of humanity, and we don't need to argue with them anymore. We will just assume that we won the argument. That's how we're going to carry on from here. And we're not going to go into any details. It's just we're done. It's, it's these people are idiots and or, or names. And it was, it was just this shocking thing from, okay, there are facts that we may be making up to, no, it's, it's not that. We don't need to go there at all. We just, we declare truth to be what we know it to be or feel it to be or want it to be. And you have no comeback. You have no response. And if you try, you're a neighbor of hope. It's yeah. that simple. It's, we're not going to listen to someone who begins by denying what we're saying. It's yeah. a priori argument is over. No, if we tried that with the gospel, if we tried that with the doctrine of God, we would be booed and hissed. Oh, that's circular reasoning. Yeah. But again, we're at the point where we no longer are arguing facts or developing any kind of, of rational response one way or the other. We're simply asserting and smiling. And as long as you have enough friends, as long as you're, you're, you're leading the polls in social media, as long as the general media is at your beck and call, it, it, it's done. And we're seeing it in the, in the election that's coming up. Uh, there's, there's, things are simply asserted as true. They may or may not be true, but we're not, we're not we're not offering proof anymore. Mm -hmm. We said it, and if you're questioning it, then you're evil. That's all there is to it. Of course, the question is, wait, what is this evil thing you speak of? Mm -hmm. And there can be no response, but there doesn't have to be anymore, because we've got to the point where even that we can, can if you don't believe in absolutes, there is no evil, and we simply get mocked. There's no intellectual processing of arguments. It's become um, more important to be part of the accepted social yeah. circle by nodding in agreement with everyone around you. Yeah, we need to, we need to belong. We need to be on the side of the good guys. Now, there there is a principle here that is that is in a sense biblical, but of course it's been distorted. Everything that Satan's got, he borrows from God and twists, and that's that we we do learn our beliefs and maintain our beliefs within a communion and a fellowship. Uh, we three get along and David, hi, and other people, <laughs> because we do share a lot of fundamental beliefs about who God is, what the Bible is, who, what the gospel is and things like that. And we have minor disagreements here and there. They're not going to overturn our fundamental commitment. And we can, and, and on that basis, there are things we can discuss and politely argue if we need to, which we rarely seem to do too much. I was um, going to say, not so, frequently <laughs> no, oh you haven't been in our house while we talk about baptism <laughs> <laughs> okay well okay anything i could say there that was smart alecky would get me in so much trouble so i'm not gonna say anything except i'm saying nothing 
if you did say anything, David edits it. He would just yeah. cut it out. Okay, yeah, just David has the power. Well, you, David assuming, controls the narrative. No, I actually was going to um, tease Emily a little bit, but um, oh, going see, to I was because, I was assuming oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's fair. You can do that. I was going to side with the head of the household here, but you know that's my patriarchism showing. <laughs> oh dear, and my old age and my senility. <laughs> that's soon going to be turning into dementia. So I am obviously not to be trusted that I would even think of such a thing. Oh my. Yeah. See, there's something else. And, and this is something I think, I think Lewis points this out. Christians can laugh at themselves. Mm -hmm. Christians can smile. Christians can laugh that we're wrong. I can look back and say, yeah, that was the stupidest idea. I don't know how I ever believed it or why I ever said that. Please forgive me. That was, I was being an idiot. That's Funny, it's laughable that I would say such a thing. I don't ever believe such a thing. Mm. Because basic to Christianity is an absolute humility. God's God. We're not. He's holy. We're sinful. We're going to get so much wrong. And we just get used to it. There's a lot in screw tape along these lines. And so we, we do interpret in terms of our communion, in terms of the faith, uh, in terms of the church Catholic, in terms of a tradition that goes back 2,000 years and more to include the Jewish church. And I, I don't get to simply make up something and say, I have found the truth that no one else has ever known, and you should all believe me because I'm so smart, and here are my rational arguments. Generally, you could say, um, you just came up with something in the Bible no one's ever thought of. Okay, one, you're wrong. I don't have to hear it. You're wrong. <laughs> I mean, if it's a minor tweak on something that we already know, okay, we'll listen. But something really significantly brand new, like there are nine Holy Spirits. No, I don't need to hear that. Um, these things have been have been forged because the truth in Scripture is objective. And here we, we fall upon not only sola scriptura, but the priesthood of the believer. The Bible is objectively true, which means it's objectively true for every believer who comes to it in faith, with the illumination of the Spirit. And so when we read the Bible, we should all more or less be getting the same thing. And that's true not only in our current generation, but over 2,000 years of church history. And, and, and so we can discuss these things. We can all bring something to the table. The simplest believer may see something that we, who pride ourselves in our theological knowledge, may have totally missed mm -hmm. and, and contribute something that's, that's profound. Even if it's only something like, you're not being very nice to each other right now. <laughs> Jesus would approve. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. If you can't say amen, <laughs> say ouch. Oh, wow, yeah. And, and, and so we can, we can have conversations like this and we can laugh about it. And we can poke fun even at ourselves. And it's okay. Unbelief has a habit of being excessively grim. Mm -hmm. uh, Lewis, at the beginning of Screw Tapes, says that uh, he, he's quoting Chesterton, who said, Satan fell by force of gravity. It took me a long time to understand what that meant. In case anybody out there doesn't get it, gravity here means over seriousness, <laughs> being grave. Satan can't take a joke. One of the things that, uh, that again, that Lewis puts in the front of uh, Screw Tape, he's quoting, uh, I don't know if it's more, if it's, oh, I think it's, it's more. Uh, the devil, that proud sprite, cannot endure to be mocked hmm. because he's so full of himself and his dignity. Hmm. And Luther says, also quoted there, um, that if the devil will not yield to text of scripture, the next best thing is to jeer and laugh at him because his pride will not handle it. Hmm. There There's, is there. Go ahead. You can also. Um, it's not foolproof because everyone's going through sanctification at different rates. But oh, yeah. uh, when individuals react in a similar way and cannot endure to be mocked or questioned even yeah. uh it's it's a very open sign to either the 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 left hand ditch of a legalistic attitude or the right hand ditch of an antinomian attitude yeah yeah when when you when you can't even let the other side ask their question or an innocent inquirer who's trying to figure out what in the world you're saying wait does this mean then and you won't even let them get it out because you have to have your speech. You have to say your words. Um, th th you there's a real sly there. dog. You got me monologuing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which Christians can use to their advantage at times. Um, <laughs> we can sit back and smile. A smile can undo so much. It can, a smile can be, in a nice sense, so vicious. Because, again, yeah, the... the Humanism, unbelief, can't laugh at itself. 
it <laughs> eternally, horribly serious. Think of hell. You know, no one's laughing and joking in hell. Everybody is full of self importance. Here you can see Lewis's great divorce to work that out and, and screw tape. So, but as Christians, we're back to yes, evil communications corrupt good manners, but within the framework of the church, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers to sanctify the body so that we pass along the truth that is the gospel to one another, like we're doing here, and in many, many ways to do it over a cup of coffee, a cup of tea a ball game, when the movies, a role-playing game, you know, piano concert, home with your spouse, whatever. You can, we, can, we can just talk about what the Bible says or what our pastor mentioned in his last sermon, the point he made, and we can build each other up. And truth does not rest upon my intensive study of a passage, let alone my intensive study of the internet, because of course, <laughs> Google knows everything. Yes, I searched this out on Google. I am an authority. Okay, you realize that most universities don't accept Google as a source, period. <laughs> but, you know, there are people who've done their research and they know everything and you cannot question them. And uh, that's tragic. But the Bible is very simple and straightforward on many things. It is deep and complex on others. But the things that, and, and the church has always confessed that the things that we, ne we need to know to know that we're sinners are simple. Mm -hmm. the, the Ten Commandments. Everyone understands thou shalt not commit adultery. There's really no confusion about that. Thou shalt not steal. It's not because these are deep, difficult things, although there is that which is deep and difficult about them. It's the part we understand that, that we don't like. That whole don't do your research thing also is an interesting bit of... Uh... I really hope I don't become known as the guy on the podcast who always goes, that's kind of Gnostic. But uh, <laughs> it's well, always Gnostic. Need someone to See, do that. when you do that, then I don't have to. And it's, <laughs> it saves time. But you're right. It is. Absolutely. Because it's basically uh, every time you talk with one of those kinds of people online, they're like, uh, I don't have the time or patience to explain this to you. So go read these articles that I read that led me to this conclusion and come up with your own conclusions that – you know, our, our secret knowledge only contained in this article at yeah. rogersblog.tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, On the other it's hand. It's a bit ag uh, agonizingly frustrating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't. But then there are those, those on, the other, on the other hand who will say, wait, but this isn't a heresy. It's never been called a heresy. Link to <laughs> denominational <laughs> website with committee report. That demonstrates how it's a heresy. I don't have time to read that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and, and and the rest of, and thank you, Brian, but the rest of the thought mm -hmm. beyond that was not only is the law clear, the gospel's clear. Mm -hmm. And it becomes clearer and clearer. And what we're expected to understand in any particular age is clear enough. Americans get that you need to turn away from your sins and trust in Jesus, the only son of God, in order to be saved. You don't, yes, there is so much more to the gospel, but that's enough. Mm -hmm. to turn your life around, to completely transform you, to make you a child of God. It's not the stuff that we don't know that's the problem. Christianity is offensive for the simplicity of what it says. Mm -hmm. The depths are there. The roots go on forever. The interconnections are infinite. And yet it comes to us very, very simply and is simple enough to absolutely offend every unbeliever and to make them hate us and want us dead because we simply agree. And as the early church, and you mentioned church confessions, the early church to begin with, and later the, the churches of the Reformation began to put these simple truths into writing. First of all, there were people who objected. Well, you can't put truth into writing. That destroys it because <laughs> truth is a feeling. It's an experience. It's an existential one-to-one -one relationship with ultimate reality. And you can't put that in words. Be well, first of all, you just did. Um, <laughs> but secondly, and, and you can't put that in writing because it's, well, because ultimately truth is irrational and subjective. And we're back to, so you're saying that there is no such thing as truth. It's just a word you use occasionally for things that make you feel really good and get you excited. And if truth is irrational, why would it make sense that it couldn't be put down in writing? Like, <laughs> if it's irrational, then why do I care what you think about the validity of its being in writing? Yeah, <laughs> like if, if truth is irrational, of course you could write it down. I mean, the New York Post is a, is a newspaper. <laughs> oh, man. It's getting spicy. 
<laughs> but back to what you were saying about the simplicity of the gospel, you know, it's it's simple enough that Christ is hated by the world, and it's simple enough that the smallest child can mm. apprehend it, that, you know, as soon as we make the gospel an intellectual assent to a set of complex theorems, you know, who have we left out? We've left out the children. We've left out those who are mentally disabled. We've left out a whole slew of people mm. for whom God cares deeply and for mm. whom he sent his son. I think it's Ma- – actually, I know it's Machen who says it, but I don't know the exact quote. That's the problem with it <laughs> is, um, you know, the the reason that Christianity affects people and has taken such root in the world is because it's a story. The gospel mm. is a story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's it is a story uh, that has roots in eternity, but manifests itself in time with real human minor actors and actresses who come and go while God remains the constant hero, initially in the background, but then he takes the stage in the person of his son, who is a real man who does real human things, feels real human emotions, makes real human choices, and lays down his life for the world. And then the story continues in his resurrection and his ascension and him sending out his guys to say, tell everybody, because this is a great, this is a great story. Mm-hmm. The greatest story ever told. I was in uh, in Rome. We were on a trip with some of our students and uh, they had been making friends with some of the other students from other schools who were traveling with us, just a handful. And there's a, and we're, my wife and I are in bed, there's a knock at the door. So I'm the one clothed. So I get up and what? <laughs> well, this, this, this girl, um, who's who's rooming with us? She's she's been asking all kinds of things about about the gospel and and about Jesus and about Judas and the Last Supper and we're not sure we can answer. Can you come and talk to her? Okay, yes, Hank. I'm sure you could do just fine, but I'll, yeah, sure. Uh, go throw clothes on, come on out, and I sit down. And, and she had seen Jesus Christ Superstar. That was her exposure <laughs> to the gospel. She actually had grown up in church. But that was what she, somehow, church had said nothing. And so she was intrigued by Jesus Christ Superstar. She said, mm-hmm. it, it, as the story is portrayed, it, it almost looks like, well, well, Judas is betraying him. It almost looks like Judas or Jesus knows it's going to happen. <laughs> almost like, he has, like that, huh? Yeah. Almost. How so, bizarre. So how does, how does that happen exactly? I said, okay, well, first of all, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you a question. Um, Who's who is who do you think Jesus is? Who's Jesus Christ? Well, he was this great man. I mean, he was so great and wonderful. It's almost like he was like God or something. And um, but his enemies, <laughs> his enemies hated him and turned on him and and they killed him. Okay, is he alive today? Oh no! Let me tell you a story. <laughs> and beginning with the betrayal, I told her the story up through the resurrection. And she was hanging on every word. And she said, when I was done, she said, that is the best story ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember this gal, actually. <laughs> yeah. Were you, were you there that year? Prior I, to I was not in the room when, when this was happening. No, but I was uh, I was there on that trip. Oh, that's right. And David was there, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, and, and David actually made in contact with her for a little while. Uh, I, so I'm not sure of everything that happened, but. Yeah, there was a point where simply telling the story, I mean, truthfully. Wait, was her name Brooke? That's what I've been thinking. Okay, because I have some books that say to Brooke from Greg, and apparently they never made it to Brooke because I have them. (laughs) Tragic. Okay, well, yeah, give her to have a chance in the month. But there was was someone, and, and she was drawn to us because our girls that she was rooming with just were nice, friendly, accepting. And talked about important things and took her question seriously and didn't shut her down. Mm-hmm. And then I was able to talk to her and tell her a story. And then David and some of the other guys who were there, other girls were able to go on communicating with her. I, I would like to know what became of her. Brooke, if you're listening, let us know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, a story and caring about people. You didn't, you didn't have to master theology uh, I most certainly believe in the doctrine of justification by faith, which, by the way, is not a particularly difficult doctrine, although my <laughs> students right now seem to be thinking so. <laughs> but, you know, they're ninth and 10th graders. Um, I was a student then once, too. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you, you don't have to understand it all to believe that God loves you and that Jesus died to save you, that he's alive, and that he can be your savior and your Lord and your friend right now. Uh, and, and, and when you believe that and, and you receive him by faith, and he's going to teach you more, and it's going to be objectively true stuff. But it's not just facts. It's not just ab theological abstractions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a generation that's, that's obsessed with relationship, but sadly, we don't know what the word means. I mean, uh, social media, in a relationship? Yes, no. Click a button. <laughs> what in the world does that even mean? <laughs> what I, kind I, I really, of relationship? Yeah, what kind of relationship? <laughs> Well, we're all, I was telling it's my students, complicated. This. Yeah. <laughs> we're all related to one another. You know, there's the whole six degrees of separation thing. Oh, yeah. But we all live in the same time on the same planet in the same generation. You know, there's all kinds of ways of being related. We all have similar DNA. We're all descended from Noah. What do you, what kind of relation? We're all Americans. Is that enough? What are you looking? No, we want something more intimate. Okay. How does that work? Does that mean sexual experience? Does that mean commitment? Does that mean obeying God's law with respect to one another? What in the world do these words mean? We know, this is a generation that knows it wants something human, but it can't mm -hmm. put its finger yeah. on it. It talks about love, and it can't define it. Mm -hmm. and it's it a is, button on your Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Or a slogan in following a hashtag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hashtag love. Love is love is love is love. Really? We're reaching a <laughs> recursive point here. <laughs> yeah. And to go back to uh, issues of assent to a series of logical thoughts or followings, mm -hmm. what is the, the most beautiful part of the gospel to me is that you can have someone who, and I love seminary. I'm a big fan of people going to seminary if they're going to be ministers but you can have somebody who goes to seminary and at the end of it understands less of the gospel than someone who just heard it five minutes ago told faithfully i mean and that that is a sad thing and i yes it is absolutely true because i've sat in on enough examinations of young men who have come through seminary mm. and are being examined by elders and pastors first of all the amount of their ignorance is staggering and, and, and But what's worse sometimes is the assumption, well, I've been to seminary. I obviously know more than all you guys. Um, <laughs> no, actually, you don't. Uh, About but, that. But, yeah, but far more important, you know, when, when you read the requirements for a pastor, elder, bishop in, in Paul. Episcopos. In yeah. <laughs> Um, there's nothing there about a theological degree. There's nothing there about knowing the original languages. It's about being a faithful husband and a faithful father mm -hmm. and, and a neighbor and friend and citizen. Those are the things that God highlights. And I know I've been pushing within, within our church, and I, and I have the years of, my, of the other elders on this one. We all agree that from now on, when someone comes to us and says, I, I think I want to be a pastor, we're going to start by asking things like, how's your relationship with your wife? Is there a problem with pornography in your house? Uh, have you and your wife learned how to settle arguments without yelling and walking out? On I mean, this this kind of relationship building in terms of God's word and in terms of death to self and, and real commitment, this has got to be basic. And um, just because you know a lot and went through a lot of classes, that 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 can be can be really, really good. I went with you, Brian. I want I want academically trained pastors. I would like pastors who know as much as I do. And, and most of my pastors, no, I think all of my pastors, no, most of my pastors have. The, old, the, the older guys have, most certainly. But there are a lot of younger guys who, who just really don't. But, you know, even if you don't, if you're willing to be humble and you're willing to learn the word of God and you're willing to work with people and love people, you can still be a fantastic pastor. You're just, you're just, you're just going to have to learn to say a lot of times, I don't know. But I'll go find out. And that's okay. You can do that. It's all right and, to, to admit your ignorance. And even the seminary trained pastors who have that humility will still have many times where they have to go, I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. Yeah. And that's a good sign. That's a good thing. Uh, when, when there's that kind of humility, when we know there's objective truth, and it's important truth, but we haven't got it all figured out yet. And that doesn't diminish the truthfulness of it. Uh, God knows, and and there is objective truth in the mind of God and the being of God, 
in who God himself is. Uh, and, and, and it's real. And the fact that I don't understand it all or know it all or can explain it all doesn't diminish the truthfulness at all. God is the faithful. It's, there's a now, I, I don't know where you two stand on this particular controversial point, but bear with me. First John 5, 7, mm -hmm. there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. That's dropped out of the newer translations, and even Calvin was questioned it to some degree. As I look at the flow of the argument, I think it's essential, because we're talking in that section about what we're talking about, faithful witness. What, what ultimately is our witness to reality and to truth? It's not the witness that God has given us on earth, as important as that is. It is the witness of God himself. It is the Father, the Son, bearing witness to each other in the Holy Spirit. That's the ultimate bedrock and foundation of all that we believe and know. If we fail, if, if the Bible is revanished from the earth, God's word is forever settled in heaven. It's settled in his very nature and being. And that witness is inescapable, which is why the Bible requires two or three witnesses to everything. Mm -hmm. If it's something that happens on earth, then there's always the three persons of the Trinity. And if one of the persons of the Trinity is taking the lead, the other two are witnesses. And the Father is never without the Son. The Son is never without the Father. They mutually indwell one another, the doctrine of perichoresis. This, this is where we start. This is where in this podcast we've tried to always go to to ground this in the being of God, in the doctrine of the Trinity, and then secondly, in the hypostatic union, the incarnation of our Lord, who being eternal God, came down where we could see and touch him and hear his words from his lips. And, be, and he can be human and we can relate to that. So that's Christianity. That's the first step. And then he gave himself for our sins because we can discuss our sins rationally. We can say, hey, that's sin. You just broke God's law. You are guilty. And we can say Jesus bore the penalty for that. And we can communicate the gospel in words. And it means something. It's not, uh, have you touched the face of God today? <laughs> I just finished Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for the first time <laughs> through. And all that that last bit reminded me of is uh, in contrast uh, you know, well, what what is the what is the question of life, the universe, and everything? We, need to, we have the answer apparently, but we don't have the question. And you know, eventually they get to this thing. They they come up with it and go, ah, how many roads must a man walk down? Forty <laughs> two. It's perfect. It, it's just vague enough to not be like dragged down into specifics, but it still answers the like it's uh, the answer makes sense with the question. And it's just like they just made it up out of whole cloth. <laughs> <laughs> have I told you my theory about why I think 42 is the answer? No, life? you have not. And I want to hear this. It is the number at the center of the numerical chiasm drawn in the 12 days of Christmas. Say what? I know what chiasm <laughs> the is because I just I Googled it the other of, day. I understood all those words. And I have no idea what you're talking about. I understand all of those words separately. Yes. <laughs> I know what so, chiasm is. I know what the 12 days yeah. of Christmas are. So if you think about how many times you receive the gift of a partridge in a pear tree, uh -huh. and how many times you receive the gift of 12, what right. is it, Lords of Leaping? Right. Yeah, I think. It's 12. Like, you get 12 of each, right? Right. And then as you get closer, you get the two turtle doves. But yeah. you get those 11 times. So you get right. 22 of those. You also get 22, 11, right. whatever. Right. So as you approach the center of the 12, you come to the 6 and 7. And how many uh, times do you receive each of those is 42. Wow. Yeah. If Douglas there Adams only knew. Yeah. <laughs> but the dolphins What's left before seven? they could tell him. Little. Yeah, that's what the dolphins were trying to tell us. Yeah. So long. Okay. Well, on that note. <laughs> on that note, do we have any On that note, so long. And thanks for all the <laughs> for fish. All the fish. <laughs> thanks for all the fish. All right. All right. Well, my, I, I actually have a recommendation for once. Uh, it is Dr. Jean Edward Beath's book, Postmodern Times, A mm -hmm. Christian Guide to Contemporary Thought and Culture. Dr. Veith is a uh, Lutheran scholar who writes on literature of various sorts. Reading Between the Lines is a book we actually use in our school regularly. But I'm going to recommend Postmodern Times because he talks to all of this and the things he has to say are spot on. They're wonderful. 
And I met Dr. V briefly, was allowed to actually have supper with him with my pastor because we spoke at the same conference. And he was quite a gentleman and he his writing is just so perceptive. It's easy to read. I mean, yes, he's talking philosophy, he's talking postmodernism, so you may have to stretch yourself a little bit. But he does not write to hear himself use big words. He writes to mm-hmm. be playing. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, and, and uses lots of cultural examples I think we can relate to. I have a friend who once dressed up as Ezra Pound in lieu of dressing up as Jean Edward Beath for a class <laughs> assignment. I don't even know how that works. It, it was a complicated story. Brian? Okay. Um, I think I'm going to recommend a concept, and that is the law gospel distinction. Because ah, yes. I feel yeah. like there are a great many people – at least loud people, so it seems like there's a lot of them, uh, who confuse those two things a wow. lot. We're very Lutheran tonight. Very yes, Lutheran. apparently. Although you're both Presbyterian and I'm Reformed, so. Yeah. yeah. We, but we appreciate but, the Lutherans, as you can see by our recommending a Lutheran <laughs> scholar and a primarily... Yeah. Well, it's not really a primarily Lutheran thing, but it's a Lutheran soapbox. Like, they're the ones they're on They're the ones soapbox. that... Yeah. Yeah. They keep that on that one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and and you are absolutely right. They they are different. They have different functions. They do different things. And right now in my Bible class, I'm, uh, my kids are memorizing Hebrews eleven, and and I had them write about discuss righteousness by faith in terms of of Hebrews eleven. And we're also going through. We were just going through Genesis in tandem with that. So they're seeing the stories played out. And they're seeing Paul's or sorry, the writer of Hebrews uh, <laughs> summary. <laughs> Of, of what these are, and, and a few of them said some some good things, but a lot of them were just came away so confused, and I would like to believe it's not my fault. Uh, but <laughs> but righteousness is by faith only, so you have to really obey God so you can have this blessing because righteousness is by faith only. Wait, what? Yeah, I mean literally, <laughs> I got I got one that was almost identical to that, and, and mm-hmm. others that were in the same camp. I, you do not seem wow. to know what these words mean. So I need to go back again and remind you that the law yeah. commands obedience or death, and we can't do that. The gospel is faith alone. Now, it leads us back to obedience by empowering us to obedience and showing us what obedience looks like. But you might as well try to get from here to there by taking your uh, roadmap, if we still had those things, and putting <laughs> it in the gas can of, or the gas tank of your car and setting it on fire because, you know... <laughs> The road Bad map, idea. The roadmap will get you there, right? Oh, no. <laughs> this is a terrible plan. <laughs> All right. That leaves you. Uh, of course, uh, the one angry email we get this week is going to be from someone uh, upset that you called Paul the writer of Hebrews. I know. Yeah, that'll be well, the one thing. I will thing. double down on that. I'm sold on the idea of Paul writing Hebrews. Some like guy. This whole, um, it's not his style. Well, Philemon did you hear him preach? It. We don't know. We don't know if that was his Yeah, that whole style. stylistic thing is ridiculous. I, I, I will not swear that Paul's the writer of Hebrews. I, I think he certainly had a hand in it. But stylistic <laughs> arguments are ridiculous. I have like five or ten different styles depending on what I'm writing. It just it change and you, it changes as you get older. And if you and if committee is involved, forget it. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, yeah. those, those those are bad arguments. Yes. Um, right. Anyway, uh, Emily, you have something. Yes, I have a recommendation. I'm going to recommend something that we talked about offline last week or maybe the week before. And Greg was like, "What? I've never heard of that." So I'm going to tell you about my cornbread hamburger skillet. Because <laughs> this is something that my mom would do like all the time. So I thought everybody had this. Like this was a normal dinner to have. I already so take, love it in concept. <laughs> it's so great. So great. So easy too. So you take your cast iron skillet or any kind of skillet that can go in the oven. And you cook up some onions and hamburger. Season it however you want. I'm not going to tell you how to season it because I know you'll come up with your own thing. Put in some taco seasoning or whatever. Make it delicious. And then, of course, you drain off the fat. And then over the top, you spoon cornbread mix, whether you've made uh-huh. it yourself or it's from a Jiffy box. I use the Jiffy right. box because I am a lazy panda. <laughs> um, and then you just put it in the oven for like 20 minutes. And then you've got this wonderful like hamburger underneath, cornbread on top. It's like it's like a casserole, but hardcore. And that's it's my like It's it's like the concept of a shepherd's pie, but you replace yeah. the mashed potatoes on top with cornbread, and I'm yes. I'm here for it. 
Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of something I've had, but there was gravy involved too. Mm. Oh gravy? yeah, I forgot to mention in the uh, in the hamburger, I put in a can of condensed tomato soup and like a third of a cup of salsa and some ketchup too, so it okay. gets a little bit more moist. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I stole All that right. from the internet, so. <laughs> Which apparently <laughs> is good for some things. Yeah. Just not for in-depth research on anything actually. Yeah. Oh. It's good oh. for finding my mother's <laughs> recipes. Yeah. All right. So that concludes our discussion of absolute truth. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We really appreciate you. Um, check out our Facebook page. Give us a like. We are posting some dank memes lately, so check those out. I don't know. What do you do with memes? Just consume them. Um, you can follow us on YouTube. Subscribe. That's the word. Um, and you can look us up on Goodreads. At least you can look up me and Brian on Goodreads. We're still working on Greg getting a Goodreads. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.